Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Franz Fanon's work, Black Skin, White Masks, is a work of psychoanalytic theory, but it's also, you could say, oriented just as equally by existentialist motifs, and they kind of fuse in together. So some of the key questions that Fanon is raising in the work are that of, you know, what is actually the, the situation, trying to peel away um, misrepresentations of the, the relations between blacks and whites and, and why this alienation that he's, he's describing early on in the work is taking place and how these are connected together. So he calls this a sociodiagnostic of the, of the situation. We could call it a sociodiagnostic of the present. He's not so much interested in tracing everything back to, you know, the past and, and this mechanistically caused this or anything like that, although he does think the past matters. And then the other key aspect of this work is determining how and where to move forward, how to get out of the dilemmas and double or triple binds that have been imposed upon both black and white subjects and people who find themselves kind of in between like him and his fellow Antillians uh, within a world that has been determined by colonialism, racism, economic exploitation, uh, an entire history. How do you move forward? How do you go into the future? How do you orient yourself towards the future without becoming, as he's called it, a slave of the past. And there's, there's two sections in this work that I think are particularly relevant to this. One is, of course, his, his conclusion, uh, which is uh, titled um, By Way of Conclusion at the very end, chapter 8, but also chapter 5, The Fact of Blackness, where he's, he's tracing out a little bit of his own story in here. And so we should look first at, at chapter five, where this, this counter narrative is being developed and explored. And he, he goes into, you know, quite a bit of uh, important discussion about how this takes place, a sort of celebration of African past and present. And it, it's really taking place in, in two different ways. There's this notion of, well, Africa is, is not a land without history as the Europeans have made it out to be. As a matter of fact, there's all these civilizations. You know, we developed this, we did this. And there, the we there is kind of a, it's a collective, but it's also, as Fanon would say, kind of hallucinatory, a, a, a fake, but imaginative we. Because it, it, Africa is a continent of peoples like every other place, you know, these categories of black and white uh, imposed through colonialism largely uh, don't make everybody exactly, you know, one members of one big tribe or, or family. So, so there's this, this celebration of, of uh, we could call it Africa's past, right? And then there's this sort of present that's being focused on, but it's a present that is in many respects, not a uh, historically present present, but rather like an eternal present talking about essences of peoples. And he's, he's got these phrases. He talks about magic at a couple different points. Um, and I, I think this is, this is quite an apt way of discussing things. So, you know, he talks about reading uh, Leopold Senor and the importance of, of rhythm and the experience of, of thinking about this, he says, Has, had I read that right, I read it again with redoubled attention from the opposite end of the white world 
So like whites are at one cor- end of the, the spectrum. A magical Negro culture was hailing me. Negro sculpture, I began to flush with pride. Was this our salvation? I had rationalized the world and the world had rejected me on the basis of color prejudice since no agreement was possible on the level of reason. I threw myself back towards unreason. And we see like stances like this, not just with with, uh, Fanon, but with all sorts of people where they're like, well, you know, Western rationality, whiteness, all that sort of stuff. That's, you know, missing out on what's really essential in human beings. This other ethnicity, whatever it happens to be, they're they're more in touch with the primal, with what's, what's really human. And so he's exploring stuff like this in terms of trying to make sense out of his own you know, conflicts. And so he says, out of the necessities of my struggle, I'd chosen the method of of regression, but it was an unfamiliar weapon. Here I am at home. I am made of the irrational. I weighed in the irrational. Um, And so he he goes on and there's, there's, you know, some long passages here. I'm going to skip ahead quite a bit. He talks about um, emotive sensitivity and that Leopold Senor is saying that, or yeah, that um, emotion is is Negro, reason is Greek, and we've we've seen these sort of things all the time, right? In the past, this is Leopold Senor sort of channeling other people, and so he says. So here we have the Negro rehabilitated, standing before the bar. Ruling the world with his intuition, the Negro recognized, set on his feet again, sought after, taken up, and he is a Negro. No, he is not a Negro, but the Negro exciting the fecund antenna of the world placed in the foreground of the world, reigning his poetic power on the world, you know, all this sort of stuff. And here he talks about a magic substitution, right? And he says... um, Like a magician, I've robbed the white man of a certain world forever after lost to him and his. And now does this actually change anything? And is it good to like indulge oneself in these things? Fanon actually says, I'm not going to say that nobody can do it. um, But ultimately, it doesn't really make any difference. It doesn't help anything. The rediscovery of African civilizations is not going to particularly help as well. He says... I rummaged frantically through all the antiquity of the black man. What I found there took away my breath. In his book, L'Abolition de l'Esclavage, Schulker presented us with compelling arguments since then for Benius, Westerman, Delafosse, all of them white, had joined the chorus. Segou, Diogene, cities of more than 100,000 people, accounts of learned blacks, doctors of theology who went to Mecca to interpret the Quran. All of that, exhumed from the past, spread with its insides out, made it possible for me to find a valid historic place. The white man was wrong. I was not a primitive, not even a half man. I belonged to a race that had already been working in gold and silver 2,000 years ago. And so, you know, this is another, there's a lot more discussion here as well. Um, This is another approach. So we've got sort of magical, eternalist approach, right? There's the black essence, the white essence. And then we've got the historical approach that says, well, as a matter of fact, there, there was you know, civilization in Africa. And this is true. This is, this is accurate, right? Some of the claims made by, by some people who go a little bit far that like all the Egyptians were black or stuff like that, clearly historically, you know, uh, unfounded. And, and uh, Fanon would, you know, if he were around hearing that sort of stuff, he would have said, well, I don't know about that. What I do know is that, you know, there were these things in sub-Saharan Africa that were quite developed civilizations. We can say something quite similar about Native Americans here as well. Think about the, you know, uh, civilizations that that arose and, you know, archaeology finds them. We're here right now in the middle of uh, here in Milwaukee and further south to Chicago. What was an, an immense trading network, right, on, you know, recently uncovered, um, does that really change anything, discovering these things? And uh, Fanon says no. And so he talks about the problematics of what he calls the dialectic. What is the dialectic? It's thinking things through, thinking about whether talking about, you know, all these discoveries changes the current dynamic of the present. Um, And so he says, this is a little bit after that section, he says, 
My unreason was countered with reason, my reason with real reason. Every hand was a losing hand for me. I analyzed my heredity. I made a complete audit of my ailment. I wanted to be typically Negro. It was no longer possible. I couldn't make that uh, recourse. I wanted to be white. That was a joke. And when I tried on the level of ideas and intellectual activity to reclaim my negritude, it was snatched away from me. Proof was presented that my effort was only a term in the dialectic. And again, he brings up um, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who's talking about uh, Seigneur. And uh, existentialism, in, in some respect, is making him distrustful of these essentialist approaches. Uh, a little bit later on in that section, he says that, Without a Negro past, without a Negro future, it was impossible for me to live my Negrohood. Not yet white, yet no longer wholly black, I was damned. Between the white man and me, the connection was irrevocably one of transcendence. And then he says something kind of interesting. He says, but the constancy of my love had been forgotten. I defined myself as an absolute intensity of beginning. So I took up my negritude and with tears in my eyes, I put its machinery together again. What had been broken to pieces was rebuilt, reconstructed by the intuitive lianas, the vines of my hands. Um, and so this, you know, is allowing him a, a reconstruction, we can say. It, not all of this has to be absolutely rejected and thrown away, but it has to be critically reappropriated. So when we look at that, that by way of a conclusion, what we get is a consideration of history or the orientation to the past. And he says, you know, um, what I'm saying here. Uh, doesn't necessarily come from the same mindset as the Negro working on a, on a sugar plantation who has to fight. And he says, um, the few working class people who I had the chance to know in Paris never took it on themselves to pose the discovery of the Negro past. They knew they were black, but they told me that made no difference in anything, in which they were absolutely right. Discovery of this, this legendary past it doesn't change the, the, the living conditions. It doesn't change the racism they're encountering. It doesn't help anything. I mean, it's, it might be interesting. It might give one a sense of pride, but it doesn't, it doesn't change anything in a, in a fundamental way. A little bit later on, he has this excellent uh, uh, discussion of this um, where he talks about children and he says that, here we go. Um, I am convinced it would be of the greatest interest to be able to have contact with a Negro literature or architecture of the third century before Christ. I would be happy to know that a correspondence had flourished between some Negro philosopher and Plato, but I can absolutely not see how this fact would change anything in the lives of the eight-year-old children who labor in the cane fields of Martinique or Guadalupe. How does that that past and all these great discoveries, how does that change their material conditions? It doesn't. It doesn't impact it in any way. As a matter of fact, it could actually make them feel worse. They could be like, well, why do I live in this crappy condition now? Right? So the, the, the focus on the past, as he says, doesn't provide any helpful guidance in the present. He says, the discovery of the existence of a Negro civilization in the 15th century confers no patent of humanity on me. Like it or not, the past can in no way guide me in the present moment. And he talks about becoming a slave to the past, becoming a slave to a particular interpretation of the human past, and then being stuck in this sort of cycle of wanting to attain some sort of rectification or revenge. He says, the problem considered here is one of time. Those Negroes and white men will be disalienated who refuse to let themselves be sealed away in the materialized tower of the past. And so for many, uh, he talks about this as, um, I don't have a purpose on earth as avenging the Negro of the 17th century. I don't have to be, uh, you know, trying to, to, to do this. As a, uh, he says, I, as a man of color, I don't have the right to seek ways of stamping down the pride of my former master. I neither have the right nor duty to claim reparation for the domestication of my 
ancestors. And this is going quite far. This is where I think a lot of people would leave um, uh, Fanon behind. And uh, you know, his response would be, I am not the slave of the slavery that dehumanized my ancestors. I, I may be trapped in you know, circumstances of the present, but they're not the circumstances of the past. And I need to recognize that so I'm not just replicating an alternate history of the past which is, in, in many respects, uh, just as delusional as the you know, fake white histories of uh, you know, the past was just fine and everything went along swimmingly, right? So this is an important thing. But what, what then do we have as orientation? He talks about this disalienation in, in this, this point, and he also says that those Negroes and white men who are going to be disalienated... Um, this alienation will come into being through refusal to accept the present as definitive. So not even the conditions of the present can be taken for granted. We have to have an orientation towards, towards something else, something more. And he uses as an example the revolts taking place in, at that time, Indochina, right, against the, the French. And he says, well, why are the Vietnamese rising up against them. It's not because they discovered some Vietnamese culture of the past. It's they're like, this present sucks. We're not going to put up with it anymore. Um, fighting against the Japanese has, has really shown us that we can probably take on the French as well. So he says, it's not because the Indochinese has discovered a culture of his own in, that he's in revolt. It's because, quite simply, it was in more than one way becoming impossible for him to breathe, Right? Um, and so he talks about revolt as, as something that is a rejection of the present. He says, the Vietnamese who die before the firing squads are not hoping that their sacrifice will bring about the reappearance of a past. It is for the sake of a present and of the future they're willing to die. So he thinks that this can be used to understand um, uh, decolonialization in, in general. He also talks about, this is a very interesting point, he's got this assertion, there is no Negro mission, there is no white burden. I find myself suddenly in a world in which things do evil, a world in which I'm summoned into battle, a world in which it's always a question of annihilation or triumph. I find myself in a world where words wrap themselves in silence, where the other endlessly hardens himself. My life is caught on the lasso of existence. My freedom turns me back on, himself, on, on myself. I do not have the duty to be this or that. And so he's talking, he began the book by talking about a sort of humanism. Humanism embraces humanity as a, a race as a problematic composed of people who've, who've oppressed each other and continue to do so in terms of all sorts of things. In, in you know, our recent history, race is, is one of those. So he, he's rejecting this idea of there being, for him, a Negro mission, as well as of the white, the white man's burden, as it was called. Um, he also goes on and talks about rights and duties. What does he have the right and duty to do? He says, um, I find myself suddenly in the world and I recognize I have one right alone, that of demanding human behavior from the other. So now this sounds as if he's getting away from race entirely. He's not, though. Um, you know, the, the entire book is, is carrying out this diagnosis, but it has to lead to something that does go beyond just reinforcing races against each other. He goes on as well and he says, I have one duty alone, that of not renouncing my freedom through my choices. Um, now here's where the existentialism comes in, right? That is, is prototypically existentialist, maintaining freedom. You can see this in Sartre and Duvoir and, and so many others, in, in Camus, in Marcel, right? And he, he goes on and he affirms a kind of solidarity at this point. I should also point out this other passage. I should constantly remind myself the real leap consists in introducing invention into existence. In the world through which I travel, I'm endlessly creating myself. I'm part of being to the degree that I go beyond it. And so he says, this is indeed the problem of action. I have to decide what I am going to do in this present. And I have to do so, he says, as, as a, a black man, uh, 
Um, but I, my situation is not unique in this respect. Right? So demanding human behavior of the other, that's a, a good place to close upon. That is going to produce conflict. That is going to generate others saying, oh, you've got it wrong. For, you know, whether they're, they're people who are uh, pro-colonialism and pro-racism or people who are anti but also think that Fanon is maybe capitulating too much, right? Um, there's multiple perspectives possible for those who want to exhibit some sort of solidarity and live out an ethical and, in, in this view, existentialist life. So Fanon is exposing himself to that, and that is the position that he's taking about how to move forward. And why doesn't he have a, a complete program in place? Precisely because he's an existentialist, because he thinks people have to take responsibility within the situations that they find themselves in, which are going to be different in 1970, in 1990, in 2020, than they were at the time that he's writing this. But the, there is a coherent program here and one that relates itself to these, these other, what he considers to be mistaken paths for understanding the relations between blacks and whites.